This week's show features a very special guest, Dana Ash. She is the co-founder of the Haven for Artists in Beirut, Lebanon. And just two weeks ago when we spoke in studio, she was talking about the revolution in Lebanon that broke out last October and the way that this creative resistance in the streets is doing for society what the government has completely failed to do. With the arrival of the COVID-19 coronavirus, the rebellion continues, but the context has changed. Here's the conversation that Dana and I had just a few minutes ago. She was speaking to me this time from New York, where she's currently kind of trapped. So you're in New York and you're dealing with the shutdown, but you're following what's happening in Lebanon. What are you hearing from your friends back home? Uh, well, well, there's different uh, there's different things that are going on. So they, we've done a na- national uh, lockdown in Lebanon, uh, and it was actually mostly pushed by the revolutionaries themselves. So they started doing campaigning to get people to stay home. They pushed for it as much as possible. Uh, about I think two days ago was when the prime minister actually did call for a, a lockdown. He still hasn't called for a national emergency. Um, and as we know, up until around uh, the 18th, there were still planes coming in from. Uh, highly uh, affected areas all over the world. So we were still getting planes coming in from Milan. We were still getting planes coming in from Iran up until the 18th of March, which was just about four or five days ago. Um, so that was another thing that the revolutionaries also pushed for, which was just to shut down at least the highly infected areas coming into Lebanon. So we have 267 confirmed cases in Lebanon, um, eight of which are recovered and four of which are confirmed deaths. Um, the Lebanese Red Cross is pretty much doing amazing work. Um, local activists and independent activists have been requesting that people do not donate to the government just because there hasn't been that built of trust yet. Um, we didn't vote for them, so we also don't feel like there are representatives as much as their representatives that were placed there. Um, and not much has changed internally as far as governmental structure for us to start having trust. So everyone is requesting that it goes directly to uh, families in need, directly to the Lebanese Red Cross, directly to hospitals that are uh, currently taking in corona cases. Um, we did have a few politicians and banks promise to donate, uh, which is fantastic because they're kind of giving back our money, um, which was one of our, our jokes of, oh, great, now you've given us 600000 back, we'll wait for the other $50 million. Um, So we're just kind of trying as best we can to make sure that the, the health uh, of our citizens and our civilians are, uh, to our best of ability, getting the funds they require. Our doctors and our hospitals are understaffed. They don't have enough uh, support and they don't have enough ventilators or any of the things that they require as far as medical equipment to continue to make sure that people and the virus does not expand. The Lebanese Red Cross posted something where it said that every single case of corona requires $836, but $836 times 267 times 447 responses a day gets a little costly. And, the, and is that covering refugees as well? No. It's covering anyone that's hit with corona. The sad thing right now is trying to get the government to understand that the refugees are a part of our society and that they are living within our country. Therefore, it is our responsibility to make sure they are safe and they are uh, you know, not contaminated, especially when they don't have access to clean water and they don't have access to the things that is necessary for any human being to live a dignified life. Um, so there are activists pushing for that as well, trying to ensure that their support gets there. But in the end, right now, with um, they're, we're getting tickets for going outside. So a lot of people are just trying to maneuver around this as much as possible. Um, they tell us we can't open our stores, and if we do, we get a ticket. But at the same time, if we don't, we don't eat. So it's kind of this catch-22 that the government has put us in and made it seem like they're doing this for our own good, when in fact they're not doing enough to ensure that we stay safe you know, if we do stay indoors. So what's happening to your creative revolution, the one we talked about on the show? Oh, well, we're still functioning. Everybody's still working. Uh, It's just our efforts have shifted towards making sure that everyone stays home, stays safe, knows what they need to do to stay hygienic and to make sure that they don't get easily infected, that they don't pass on this uh, this virus and they don't infect anybody that is vulnerable within their families and within their communities. Um, Of course, the issue in Lebanon is the economic crisis. A lot of people cannot afford to stay home. Um, I believe quarantine is also a form of privilege, you know, being able to stock up on food and not going to work and being able to still have electricity when you can't pay for your electricity bill, um, which is also another thing that we found extremely funny. We got a bunch of electricity bills in Lebanon during quarantine. 
So it's like, okay, so how do you expect people to pay for this? Um, and instead of having our government go out and say, okay, we will suspend, let's say, payments to uh, electrical, you know, anything, you know, that is a public institution will suspend these payments, will suspend taxes. Um, instead, they put more money into helicopters to go around the cities and the country saying, stay home. Um, instead of doing that, a lot of people have revolted in the uh, rebelled in the sense of, well, if I stay home, I can't feed my children. So our, our MPs and everybody has been called and requested by activists to uh, relinquish their salaries and that their salaries, because they don't need it, they have millions of dollars, that they give their $8,000 salary to hospitals and people in need. Uh, I believe only four MPs have said they would, but we haven't actually seen them do it um, out of 128. Uh, so we have this kind of conflict that we're still trying to push them to take responsibility um, for a, the fact that they're the only ones still getting salaries and we are still people that are not getting paid, we're getting locked at home and we cannot pay for, uh, for our basic services yeah. that they're still demanding for us to pay. So very quickly, um, with respect to your rebellion in the streets, your revolution in the streets, what happens to that? If so much of the emphasis in our conversation was on people coming into the streets and now there's a no one in the streets order. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because our, our shift has always been, like I, I always say, um, activists, civil society members, uh, artists, all of us have taken it upon ourselves to, to fill in the lack and the void that the government has not filled, uh, whether it be in services or assistance or aid or any of that. It's always been NGOs, it's always been activists, it's always been civil society, um, and we've always tried to like pick up the slack, but frankly, the slack has been immense and it's us doing the government's job. Um, and that's what it's continued into, but now, it's become every citizen's responsibility. Um, and they're doing it so well. They're taking care of each other. There's so many independent um, uh, activists and people just from around the region that are younger, uh, that are saying you know, to older people, stay home, we're going around, they're just delivering food, they sanitize the food, they help elderly that are stuck at home and can't function. So there's more and more kind of uh, initiatives that are spread out in this and that have just shown the extent of the lack that the government has and how much we want to fill that. So the very thing that we talked about, about how the rebellion was in effect creating a society in a vacuum is continuing. Big time, big time. And, and more so across borders. I mean, it's, it's no longer about me helping just the elderly in my neighborhood. It's about making sure that no elderly person uh, and no one that is vulnerable to this virus gets afflicted simply because they can't get their groceries. So do you think that you will come out of this, the revolutionary movement in Lebanon will come out of the COVID crisis stronger than you might have otherwise? Or are you afraid that the military's role right now of containing control, of retaining control, um, will make it harder for the rebellion to continue? Well, there's a joke that goes around right now, especially with the activists that, have, that were involved in closing roads back then where the military and uh, the riot police would come by force and open these roads. Now they themselves are closing the roads. So we're kind of saying thanks for giving us a break. Um, <laughs> but we'll be right back to those roads as soon as, uh, uh, as, soon as the virus is under control and uh, is contained and people aren't, uh, of course, at risk at it anymore. If anything, what, what Corona did is re, uh, kind of reinforce how much we need to re revolt. Uh, how much of these things are lacking, our health care, our support systems, our social welfare, um, you know, uh, pensions for the elderly, being able to pay ridiculous amount of taxes for nothing in return. Um, it's just made people more angry now because they're stuck at home and they're still paying. So in a way, your revolutionary movement puts you in pretty good stead in this moment. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, <laughs> we're all really, we, we, we will not lose hope. It's not something we can lose. It's, uh, it's not an option for us. Uh, losing hope is a privilege that we cannot afford. We will continue. We will push forward. And uh, whenever this crisis is done, we'll deal with the next crisis. Luckily, Lebanon has had, I believe, six crises in a row. So <laughs> when we get to number seven, I'm sure we'll be stronger. And more I, I've heard that it's a magic number, Dana. Yeah, I mean, so. All right, I'm going to let you go. Have a wonderful day, Laura. You too. Be safe. Bye. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye.